the rest of it, all of it. We're gonna do acids, we're gonna do molecular compounds, and we're gonna do organic compounds today. Um, oh yeah, I like this quote too. Almost all aspects of life are engineered at the molecular level, which is pretty cool if you think about it. And without understanding molecules, we can only have a very sketchy understanding of life itself. I like that this guy used the term very sketchy. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so understanding molecules, you can understand how anything works at a deeper level. Right, so talked about ionic compounds, and ionic compounds are just, you balance the charges, essentially. Um, for molecular compounds, we have to name them differently because they are, well, they're molecular, so they're not combined in ratios based on their charges balancing. They're based on what the actual molecule is. And so we could have any number of really any non-metal element, any combination. So here, like nitrogen monoxide, nitrogen dioxide, dinitrogen monoxide, dinitrogen uh, trioxide, dinitrogen tetroxide, and dinitrogen pentoxide. So a lot of different compounds, all using nitrogen and oxygen, and we need to be able to specify exactly how many nitrogens and how many oxygens there are in each of those, because each one is a new, different, unique compound. So we didn't have to do that with ionic compounds, because the charges balance. So if you have a certain amount of positive charge, then the negative charges will balance that out. Equal but opposite charge from the negative. Uh, and that makes these, I guess it depends from person to person, which one you think is easier or more confusing. Um, in some ways, these are easier. So for molecular compounds, because there's no way to just sort of figure out what the ratio of the elements is going to be, we have to use prefixes to indicate exactly how many of each element are part of the compound. <clears throat> so similar to what we were doing with hydrates, uh, I think pretty much all of these are here are gonna be the same. We don't have hemi, obviously. Um, so we got mono, di, tri, tetra, penta, hexa, hepta, octa, nona, and deca. These ones you kinda of have to come up, for some of these you have to come up probably with your own ways of remembering them. Mono means one, you know, if you're gonna fight mono e mono, uh, one on one. Di is two. Tri, I think, is easy, because tricycle has three wheels. Tri is three. The one that's weird and that we don't use very often, right? we talk about quad, or your quads, or uh, if you're riding quads, right? Uh, recreational vehicles with four wheels. So in chemistry, though, we use tetra instead. Tetra means four. Penta is five. Uh, you can think of a pentagram as a five-sided polygon. Hexa, uh, I don't know if I have one for hexa. I mean a hexagon um, is probably the most familiar thing. Heptagons, hepta means seven. Octa, like octopus, is eight. Nana, kind of sounds like nine. That one's easier to remember. And then deca uh, is 10. It's like a decade, it's 10 years. Did we have any like, was there remember ones like tetra or hexa or tetra and tetris? All right, that works. Yeah. But isn't isn't a tetris when you get five rows? Yeah, but all the blocks that you use. This is all the four cubes or four squares. Oh, I thought the long straight long ones were five. I don't know. <laughs> Not enough Tetris, apparently. <laughs> if it's four, then, then a Tetris is getting four rows at the same time. I never realized that every, every shape was four. That makes sense now. Huh. Learn something every day. <clears throat> so when you're naming these compounds, most of the time you're gonna have either the compound or the formula, so you're gonna be given the order. Um, in most examples, if you don't have that, if you're just trying to make a compound out of uh, two different elements, you generally start with the uh, most metal-like element. It will also be the element with the smallest group number. Let's just pull the periodic table down. 
probably a list in the book also. That's just the order. Um, but it would go, so it goes carbon, phosphorus, nitrogen, hydrogen, uh, sulfur, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. Uh, yeah. So generally the one with the smaller group number comes first. But yeah. You'll be given those in order most of the time, almost all the time. So if two elements are in the same group, then you write the element with the greatest row number first. So if you had nitrogen, phosphorus, then you'd write phosphorus before nitrogen. If they're in the same row, then carbon comes before nitrogen. <clears throat> and then hydrogen just gets slipped in there because. So we're gonna be naming binary molecular compounds. And so we're gonna be using a prefix and then the name of the first element and then another prefix for the second element, and then for the second element, you change the ending to IDE, similar to what we were doing for ionic compounds. And then if the first element in the formula, uh, if there's only one of them, then you usually drop mono. It's not gonna be wrong if you include mono, but usually it gets dropped. So this would not be mononitrogen dioxide, it would just be nitrogen dioxide. And then for H2O and ammonia, they always use their common names, water or ammonia, unless you're trying to scare people and then you call it dihydrogen monoxide. Tell people that it's like the number one killer. Uh, yeah. <laughs> nice. <laughs> that's, that's good. I'm assuming, how old, how old were you? Oh, 10. 10, yeah. It's a good prank for a 10 year old. <laughs> it was awesome. Uh, yeah. All right, so if we want to name the compound N2O5, can start by just writing out the elements. And so we're gonna change the ending of oxygen to IDE. I think after we talked last time, it was, it's always after the first syllable. Or it's the last syllable? No, it's after the first syllable. Oxide, sulfide, nitride, carbide. So how many, what's the prefix for two? Dinitrogen. And then I probably should have left a little more. Pentaoxide. Or if you get two syllable or two vowels like this smashed up together, usually drop one of them. Um, so pentoxide. And I think it's this, usually this, the prefix is last syllable that gets dropped. So what would the formula be for phosphorus tribromide? Yep, because we got phosphorus, it's just gonna be P, and it's the first element, and because there's only one of them, we leave off the mono, and then it's tribromide, so Br3. So, prefixes only with molecular compounds. You never wanna see a prefix on an ionic compound. I will be sad. I will groan and I will hang my head in shame when I grade that. So if it's, if it's non-metals, absolutely, prefixes. If it's a metal and a non-metal, it's gonna be ionic, no prefixes. All right, acids. So acids are a special kind of molecular compound. They release hydrogen ions when they dissolve in water. Acids are composed of uh, hydrogen, which is usually written first in their formula, and then one or more nonmetals, which are written second. So uh, we're gonna talk about two different kinds of acids. Uh, HCl is a binary acid. So when you add this to water, and on Wednesday we're actually gonna talk about solutions, it forms H plus ions and Cl minus ions. And I think we've talked about aqueous, AQ means aqueous or dissolved in water. 
uh, and this one gets overlooked a lot, a compound is not considered an acid if it does not dissolve in water. So all of our acids will be aqueous. So characteristics of acids, acids have a sour taste, they dissolve many metals like zinc, iron, magnesium. They don't dissolve other metals uh, like gold, silver, or platinum. Uh, I believe we'll talk about activity series. And they generally start with H. So you can have one hydrogen, like in HCl, hydrochloric acid, or you could have two hydrogens, like in sulfuric acid. All right, so these are the types of, uh, two different types that we're gonna name. Binary acids, which are just going to be hydrogen and then a nonmetal. So you're gonna have two elements, one's gonna be hydrogen, the other one will be another nonmetal. And then oxy acids, uh, which contain hydrogen and then an oxy anion. So we went over last time uh, all of those ways to remember the different oxy anions. Also help out with oxy acids. Binary acids are nice and easy to name. <clears throat> you change a pref you add a prefix of hydro, and then you follow with the name of the nonmetal and you change the ending to IC. And then write the word acid at the end of the name. And there's a space in there. So HF, yep, prefix of hydro. And then we go fluoric, so we added the prefix, we add a suffix, and then acid. There really are a limited number of these because there's a limited number of nonmetals that you can do this with. <laughs> hydrofluoric acid, hydrochloric acid, hydrobromic acid, hydroiodic acid, and what would the formula be for hydrosulfuric acid? H2S. Why is it H2S? Sulfur has a negative two charge. And so then we always have as many hydrogens as we have negative charges on the anion. Hydrosulfic acid. <clears throat> we'll talk about the importance more of that hydro, because when you're naming oxy anions, you end up with a similar name without the hydro. All right, so oxy anions, or oxy acids, are a little bit more complicated. Uh, first, you identify the name of the oxy anion. So if it ends with A-T-E, then you change that to I-C. If it ends with I-T-E, then it changes the ending to O-U-S. Any of your prefixes stay the same. So if you have perchloric acid, that's perchlorate in its acid form. So if it's per or hypo on the front, those stay the same. Just change the ending and add the word acid to the end. So how do we name the acid here? So hydrogen, nitrogen, two oxygens. Yeah, what's the oxy anion first? Nitrite, so that's NO2 minus. So it's gonna be, oops. We change that ending of ITE to OUS and add acid, nitrous acid. This is not the same nitrous that you would put in your car. I mean, even that's not recommended. <laughs> yeah. So perchloric acid. So what is that? IC ending, if we want to go back to the oxy anion. Yeah, so we change IT or ATE to IC 
when we're naming the acid. So perchloric acid is gonna be ClO4, whoa, minus. So it helps to write out the oxyanion first because then you know how many charges the oxyanion has and that's how many hydrogens it gets. So HClO4. That's okay. Uh, so when the name ends, well, when the name ends in acid, its formula is going to start with H. I feel like I might have copied these out of order a little bit. Um, anyway, we'll keep going through more examples though. So write the formula as if, it, as if ionic, even though it's molecular. So you're gonna write out, like I was doing with the oxyanions, write out the oxyanion first, or write out the element, like sulfide, write that out first. Um, <clears throat> even though it's molecular, if it's a hydro prefix, that means it's gonna be a binary acid. Um, if there's no prefix, so if it doesn't have hydro on the front, that means it's going to be an oxy acid. And again, we're just doing sort of the reverse of what we just did, where we change the ending. If the ending is IC, that'll go back to ATE. If the ending is OUS, then the polyatomic ion ends on ITE. And that's just to help you figure out uh, which ion it is and which charge, um, so you can figure out how many hydrogens go with it. I ate something icky. Okay, eight goes with the IC icky. I like that, I ate something icky. All right, so hydrocyanic acid. That one, this is actually a tricky one. Yeah, so we have a hydro here. So what kind of acid is it gonna be? Binary, technically. So binary acid, but what is, so for cyanic, if we change the IC to ATE, it's cyanate. Cyanate is CN minus. So it's HCN. Another name with it for this would be hydrogen cyanide, which is very poisonous. For those biology folks of you, it blocks the uh, cytochrome C oxidase, which is the last step of the electron transport chain. And only some fungi and plants have an alternative oxidase so that the hydrogen cyanide, if it stops the regular cytochrome C oxidase, they still have another pathway for the electron transport chain. All right, sorry, sidebar there. Phosphoric acid. Is this, well, what kind of acid is it? Oxy acid. And we know it's gonna be phosphorus. And if the IC changes to ATE, I should do all these transformations. So, so the IC will change to ATE, which means that we have phosphate. What charge does phosphate have? Three minus. So phosphoric acid should have how many hydrogens? Three. So this will be H3. PO4. How about hypochlorous acid? What kind of acid is it? Oxy acid. Yeah, don't get the hypo confused with the hydro. So it means an oxy acid. So hypo 
and then OUS changes into ITE. I us. Good. So then hypochlorite. You know it's going to be chlorine, but how many oxygens? Just one. And what charge? Yep. So then how many hydrogens? Just one. H C L O. Then I also wanted to show you this. The reason that we need the uh, hype or hydro to determine whether or not there's a binary or an oxy acid is because we could write um, chloric acid and that would be what? HCl O3. But Hydrochloric acid is just HCl. So that hydro is in there because we essentially use the same naming scheme for the binary acids and the oxy acids. Um, but the hydro tells us, oh, it's just going to be binary, just hydrogen and one other element. Whereas without that hydro, it's one of the oxy acids. Okay. This is the inorganic naming flow chart. I would challenge you to try and make one of these on your own um, because it helps lay out in a very logical way the questions that you need to ask to determine how you should name each and every compound. So we could even start not just from ionic molecular or acids, but you could have some unifying question up here to say, okay, does it start with an H? Right, so if it starts with an H, that means it's gonna be an acid. If it starts with a metal, that means it's gonna be ionic. If it doesn't start with a metal or a hydrogen, then it's going to be a molecular compound. And so try and figure out which questions you can ask to sort of separate these three things out. Right. And then once you get through, we'll say you go to the ionic, then your next question is, does it form only one type of ion or does it form more than one type of ion? Whichever one of those you answer yes to, then you keep going and that'll take you to the naming scheme that you need to use there. <clears throat> if you can sort of write this out as a series of rules, uh, then you've definitely got it down how to name each and everything. Okay, I know we went through those kind of fast, but the lab tonight is all about this. So it's just a lot of naming. So let's move on to organic compounds. <clears throat> so early chemists divided compounds into two groups, organic and inorganic, and they called compounds from living things organic and things from non-living environment were called inorganic. And uh, yeah, the organic compounds now are not just found in, um, uh, not just found from living things. Oh, I guess I got a little ahead of myself. So in, back in the day, I should say, the organic compounds were more easily decomposed than the inorganic compounds and they could make inorganic compounds in the lab, but they couldn't make those organic compounds. Today, organic compounds are commonly made in the lab and they're all around us. I mean, every, just about every drug that you take, whether it's ibuprofen to something else, um, ibuprofen, well actually Tums is an inorganic compound, um, but like cough syrup, anything that, any drug is probably an organic compound and probably synthesized in a lab somewhere. The exception of things like insulin, which I think are made by uh, genetically engineered bacteria. So organic compounds are those composed of carbon, hydrogen, and then sometimes with oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur. And it, 
than trace amounts of other elements. So if you're familiar with hemoglobin, hemoglobin uses an iron atom to bind to the oxygen, um, and that's how it transports the oxygen to your cells and throughout your body. Without that iron, it wouldn't work, but the rest of the molecule is carbon, hydrogen, uh, probably oxygen, nitrogen, and sulfur. I don't know about the other trace elements in hemoglobin. So the carbon bonds in organic compounds are almost exclusively covalent. We haven't really talked about bonds all that much yet, but covalent bonds are where they're sharing electrons. And carbon always forms four covalent bonds. And that can be any combination of single, double, or triple bonds, as long as they add up to four. So four single bonds, three single, or two single bonds and a double bond, that kind of thing. Even three, or even a triple bond and a single bond. And then it'll either be bound to other carbons or other elements. And because of this, actually, the chemistry of carbon is very unique and complex because of all the crazy different structures that it can make. Basically, any plant matter is primarily made of carbon. We're primarily made of carbon. Um, and all those different combinations are let us be alive. So you can get a lot of different crazy structures. Um, these are structural formulas with all the hydrogens written in. If you take more organic chemistry, usually you leave uh, most of the hydrogens out because they get pretty busy. <clears throat> so we'll talk about how to name these and even talk about a few different functional groups. So you basically take all compounds, you could say that they're inorganic compounds or organic compounds. Inorganic compounds are the ones we already learned how to do. So you have that flow chart or flow charts for the inorganic compounds. In the organic compounds, we can break that down to pure hydrocarbons, which is uh, most of what your car runs on, gasoline, it's all hydrocarbons. There's some other things in there, and now actually a lot of the time ethanol, <clears throat> which ethanol would be a functionalized hydrocarbon. So it's not just carbons bound to other carbons, but there's other atoms that are in there, and we say that those other atoms lend that hydrocarbon functionality. So they're almost like, well, I guess you could think of uh, hydrocarbons as modular molecules. And by adding on different modules, it allows them to interact with things in different ways. So, well, just like I just said, uh, oil, but also gasoline, liquid propane is a hydrocarbon, natural gas is also a small hydrocarbon. So they're all around, and they're very useful. Um, so to name hydrocarbons, it's uh, sort of similar to, it's the same idea as naming the inorganic molecular compounds where we have certain words that mean a certain number of things. But for the hydrocarbons, each of these words is representing a certain number of carbons. And then we add different suffixes depending on how many double bonds there are or triple bonds. So our hydrocarbons will consist of a base name and a suffix. So we're gonna give more time on this because this is the stuff that you've definitely not seen before, unless you're taking the other organic class. <clears throat> so base name, again, depends on the number of carbon atoms. So we have meth, eth, prop, but, pent, hex, hept, ox, non, and dec. And these are very similar to the other ones uh, that we have for molecular compounds except for one through four. One through four have their own special organic chemistry names, meth, eth, prop, and bute, and after that, it's the same. So these are, these are the names here, and then ethyl, propyl, butyl, you'll have to just memorize those ones. And then the suffix is determined by the types of bonds. So if it's all single bonds, then it's A and E, ane. 
if there's at least one double bond, then it's ene, E-N-E, and if there's at least, I should write this. So this is just single bonds. This is at least one double bond. And then Y-N-E, ein, is at least one triple bond. <clears throat> All right, so for some common hydrocarbons then. I don't know why it skips eth, well, ethene. Uh, methane is the primary component of natural gas. Propane is LP gas, which is liquid propane. LP stands for liquid propane. So if you have a propane grill and you go and you fill up a tank with propane, you're actually filling it up with liquid propane. And then it just, at regular pressure, it turns into a gas. Um, so for our grills and outdoor stoves. And butane is a common fuel for lighters. Um, so that's why the lighter, well, the longer the carbon gets, the more likely it is to be a liquid at room temperature. So butane is a larger molecule than propane. And that's why your lighter, if you get a lighter, it doesn't have to be under super high pressure like liquid propane does. But it'll still be a liquid. Um, pentane is a major component of gasoline. Ethene is actually a ripening agent in fruit. So if you have something that's not ripe and you want it to get more ripe, if you put it in a bag with an apple, apples produce a lot of ethene, it'll help other fruit to ripen. If you don't want them to ripen, then don't put them next to your apples, because <laughs> uh, it'll ripen them faster. And then ethene is a fuel for welding torches. Um, or, yeah, ethene, what am I thinking of? Is it the same as acetylene? I think it's also acetylene. So if you have like an acetylene oxygen torch, that's ethyne. So just a common name. All right, so notice that these are all carbons and hydrogens, right? There's nothing else that's going on with these. They can have some of what we would call functionality, so like double bonds or triple bonds, um, but we can do more complicated things with them. So functional group derives from the functionality or chemical character that a specific atom or group of atoms imparts on an organic compound. And depending on where it's attached to the compound, it'll be slightly different, right? That functionality that's imparted. Um, so a group of organic compounds with the same functional group forms a family or a family of compounds. Uh, one of the most common ones, the methanol or isopropanol, which are both members of the alcohol family. And the alcohol functional group is this OH. So in lab, in chemistry, if you're talking to somebody, alcohol refers to any of these hydrocarbons that has an OH group to it. If you're outside of the lab and you go to a bar, then alcohol refers to ethanol which would be CH3, CH2, OH. And that's the only one that's safe to drink. Well, it's safe. It's not good for you still. Um, methanol will make you go blind first. And then it might kill you. It's very bad for your liver. Um, and then isopropanol is rubbing alcohol. So there are other families of compounds, and just like those alcohols, um, they really only depend on having inclusion in a family of compounds. You only have to have one of these functional groups. So ethers are where you, where you have, oh, I should explain these two. This R just means any hydrocarbon. So you could replace that R uh, with just CH3, so a methyl group or longer chains. There are some examples here. So ethers are where you have this oxygen sort of bridge in your hydrocarbon. So you've got carbons on one side, carbons on the other, and they're connected together or linked by an oxygen. Uh, aldehydes are where you have 
this double bonded oxygen group, uh, which is a larger family of compounds. And so it's this, it's specifically the oxygen with a double bond to carbon, and then that carbon on one side has a hydrogen. That's an aldehyde. Ketones are where if you take that hydrogen and you replace it with another hydrocarbon, and so you've got this ketone, this double bonded oxygen in the middle of your hydrocarbon chain. Um, carboxylic acids, which are things like acetic acid is a carboxylic acid. It's specifically when you have a carbon double bonded to an oxygen again, and then with an OH on the side. So different from an alcohol, even though it also has an OH. <coughs> And then esters are kind of like a cousin to ethers. They also have similar names. But now instead of just having the oxygen bridge, we now have carbon with a double bond to oxygen on one side of that oxygen bridge or that oxygen link. These are all, this double bonded carbon oxygen is also called a carbonyl. And so these compounds are all part of the carbonyl family and there's just variations on that. And then amines are where you have uh, nitrogen uh, on your molecule and specifically, well, actually I guess, yeah, so this is nitrogen incorporated uh, to your compound. Specifically nitrogen with a single bond to oxygen and then hydrogens. And amines generally smell bad. Does anybody know why amines smell bad? So, you know what proteins are made out of? Huh? Amino acids. Yeah, amino acids. And amino acids are a combination of a carboxylic acid and an amine. And so when you take those, car or those um, amino acids and you break them down, um, so something dies and it's decomposing, you get a lot of these small amine compounds that get or released, and that's why they smell bad. So it's kind of like our body's warning signal to say, hey, that thing's rotten or rotting because it's got all these broken down amino acids. And they also attract flies. So amines kind of smell like rotten flesh? Yeah, rotten, just smell bad. <laughs> Different levels of bad depending on the amine. Yeah. Okay, so that was all of those. Um, we're gonna keep it simple in terms of what I expect you to remember. Um, so be able to draw out the simple hydrocarbons. Not gonna be incorporating double bonds or triple bonds into them. Um, Cause we don't even talk about how you would name or identify where those would go, but you need to be able to identi identify for the families of compounds and then be able to draw structural formulas for hydrocarbons. Oh yeah, line angle? Yeah, line angle. Yeah, if you want to use line angle, you can. So, so nonane, how many carbons does nonane have? Nine. Nana means nine, so Regular structural formula would be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And then hydrogens. And remember, every carbon has to have four bonds. And if it's not another carbon, anything left over is a hydrogen. And so these are all H's. It's a lot of H's. So that's like your regular structural formula. The line angle formula would be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, or sideways. Uh, the way the line angle formula works is any end of a line or any uh, angle in a line is a carbon. And if there's not something else written in, then everything else would be hydrogens. 
but we just assume all the hydrogens. Way faster. Okay, so what family would this compound belong to? It's got single bonded carbons, but it's also got these oxygens in it. Yeah, it's a carboxylic acid. So if you have carbon with a double bond to an oxygen and then a single bond to an oxygen with an OH, carboxylic acid. If it doesn't have the hydrogen, then it's a carboxylate. I don't expect you to remember that distinction. Just throwing it out there. Hmm. 